Uh, then go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 4, where we're going to continue at this morning, looking at verses uh, 30 to 34, as we take a look at the final parable of this little cluster that we have here in, in chapter 4 uh, uh, that Jesus gave. Uh, and most of your Bibles probably calls this the parable of the mustard seed. That's probably what most of your Bibles say. Uh, but I've titled this message the, the Kingdom of God because that's what the parable is all about the, and how the, the kingdom will grow. And if I were just to, to pause right now and go around this room and ask each one of you uh, what is the Kingdom of God, uh, I would probably get lots of different answers, but most of you would probably say that the Kingdom of God is heaven. And you would be absolutely correct, but see, it's more than that. It's more extensive than that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's more vast than, than just that, that one thing. That, that most people would even, uh, or even in the Bibles, we, we know that uh, the term kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, are used interchangeably. And so that is a very uh, true statement uh, there. But the, the phrase, the, the, the kingdom of God, or, or, or the, the, it just being a place, uh, it, it's not just that, that what's not what it is. When Jesus came, that the presence of God, or the kingdom of God, drew near to men. And, and as we pray the, the model prayer, that's thy kingdom come, right? That's what we want this to to have happen and so it's it's kind of a hard concept for us to get our mind around exactly what is the kingdom of god is it a place or is it a is it a, a state of being well the truth be known it's both right it, it, it's it's all those things it, it's all those things uh, that uh, com combined at one time we can think of the the kingdom of god as as maybe in, in three distinct ways maybe the as the 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 eternal reign of christ we can think of it that way whereas it's the uh, where the kingdom of God is the eternal reign and rule of Christ over all of creation, uh, that, that from his throne in heaven he reigns, as Psalm 103, 19 declares to us, it says, uh, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom uh, rules over all. That is, there has never been a time where God has not ruled over his creation, and guess what, there never will be a time where God does not reign and rule over all of his creation. Uh, secondly, we could think of it as the the, the kingdom could be the, the spiritual reign of Christ. And this is the one that would impact us in the here and now. This is, this is where uh, we think of uh, the, the Christ reigning and ruling in the hearts and lives of, of every one of his people, of all of his disciples. And this happens through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, right? This is only for believers that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within every one of us who place our faith in Christ through repentance of our sins and, and placing our faith in Jesus and so the, 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 the key here is uh, for the, the kingdom of God to impact us as individuals, directly as individuals, we must be born again. That's, that's what the Bible says, that we must be born again. We must place our faith in Jesus. And, and, and Jesus made this clear as he had this, had this nighttime conversation with a Pharisee named uh, 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 Nic uh, uh, Nicodemus. And some of y'all may have heard in the past, it's Nick at night. If you have kids that like to watch the Nickelodeon, Nick at night, he had this conversation. What, what, how does this work? How, how does the kingdom of God work? And, and Jesus gave him this answer in John 3, 5 to 7. How must a person be born again? He said this. Uh, he says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again with the emphasis on there must be born again must be born again it's not optional we must be born again that those that repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus are as the Bible says they're born again they are born of the spirit and they will uh, become uh, members of the kingdom of God they will be welcomed into the kingdom of God because they are members of the kingdom of God or as the apostle Paul would say they have become citizens of heaven but on the flip side of that, in a, in a negative sense, those that reject Jesus and those that reject the gospel cannot enter the kingdom of God. They cannot enter the kingdom of God. And in fact, in, instead of Christ reigning and ruling in their lives, uh, 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 the lives of unbelievers, the Bible tells us that it's sin that reigns and rules in their lives. So that's what it says. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, they will not uh, enter the kingdom of God. They will not dwell in the kingdom of God. Instead, their eternity, hell will be their eternal home instead of the kingdom of God. And so that's the negative aspect of this. And the last way we could think of the kingdom of God is the, the literal reign, the literal reign of Christ. And this is whenever Jesus will, will physically and bodily reign and rule from Jerusalem 
for a period of a thousand years that the Bible teaches us and that, that he will uh, reign from Jerusalem there and, and he will literally be the king of the world. Right? That's what we're talking about. So that's kind of just to give us a, just a little taste of what we're talking about when we're talking about the kingdom of God. And so the only way we can know these truths and the only way we can know these things is because we have the revealed uh, scriptures. We have all the word of God to us. We have the New Testament. And you see the disciples that Jesus was talking to they didn't have all the things that we have. This We didn't have the full revelation of God. They were The New Testament was being written. The New Testament was playing itself out as he was speaking to them. And that's what we're going to see here this morning. That Jesus was having to teach them about the kingdom of God. And, and they were having a very hard time, right, getting a hold of this truth and, and understanding it just like we would have been. And it may be some of you here this morning said, Brother Mike, I'm right there with those disciples. Even though we have the word of God, all of it, I'm still confused. I'm still confused about the kingdom of God. And so if that you find yourself in that group this morning, you are in very good company, and it's okay. And so hopefully this morning as we, we spend our time together looking at this, this parable, we'll leave here a little better informed on under, and understanding the kingdom of God a little bit better uh, as we spend our time here this morning. So go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them with you and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word together. And if you don't have a a Bible with you, it's okay. We'll have the scriptures on the screen for you as well. You can just follow along. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 34. It says, Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large, large branches so that the birds of the air may rest nest under its shade and with many such parables he spoke uh, the word uh, to them as they were able to hear it but without a parable he did not speak to them and when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples father we are so thankful this morning to be able to gather in this place and to be under your word god we ask that you teach us today that the holy spirit would would inform our understanding of this text lord that our eyes would be open that we would have ears to hear this morning God, help us to understand the, 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 the vastness and the greatness of the kingdom of God. And Lord, help us to understand that the invitation to become members of this kingdom is available to all of us today. God, help us to, to love you more. Help us to understand your word more. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to kind of start backwards. I know for some of you type A'ers. You, don't, you won't like this, but that's okay. I think it's, it's, it's necessary. And I'm going to start by explaining uh, the last two verses uh, first. And it's just a, the reminder here, talking about what, you know, the purpose of a parable. That's what he says there in 33 and 34. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. And so a, a parable, what is a parable? We talked about it a, a little bit a few weeks ago. And the definition that we, we came up with is that a parable is simply a story used to illustrate a, a moral or spiritual lesson. And see, Jesus didn't always speak in parables. Before, he would uh, speak plainly and openly. But what happened was, is the religious leaders and those who hated Jesus, uh, they went too far when they began to accuse him of being possessed by Satan and, 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 he, and doing all the works that he was doing by the power of Satan. And, and things changed, that the hardness of their hearts uh, change the way Jesus would, would teach, that, that he, would, he would now speak only in parables as a form of judgment uh, against those that had hardened their hearts towards him and his gospel. You see, they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus. They hated him. They rejected him. They rejected his offer of forgiveness. He was not the Messiah. In their opinion, they thought he was a blasphemer. And because of their open hatred and because of their open rejection of, of his teachings, they would be now... Now they would be prevented from understanding Jesus' teachings and entering into the kingdom of God. So this was a, a, a huge change, a, a huge shift in the way Jesus uh, taught. But he would, uh, the text tells us that he would explain uh, the, the parables to his disciples. And afterwards he would tell them uh, uh, what he meant by those sayings. Because, and he would also share uh, the explanation with those whose hearts were open uh, uh, to, to, uh, and receptive to his teachings. They were as we learned a few weeks ago, good ground, right? They were receptive to what he had to say. And uh, pastor and theologian and author John MacArthur, a man I often refer to, he explained 
uh, it this way, what was going on. He said that parables had a clear twofold purpose. They hid the truth from self-righteous or self-satisfied people who fancy themselves too sophisticated to learn from him, while the same parables revealed truth to eager souls with childlike faith, those who were hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I think that's a great explanation. Those who have already formed an opinion, those who have already decided that, that they don't believe the Word of God, they don't believe in Jesus, all those things, then, then when the Word of God goes forth, they just they can't understand it. They have no desire to understand it. But those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, those who want to know the Word of God, those who want to be transformed and changed, guess what? Then, then God will give you that ability. He'll give you the understanding of the text. It still works the very same way, not just with the parables. It also works with all of Scripture in the same very manner. So, I would just say it this way. You know, for us, if you're here this morning and you're willing to learn the Word of God, you want to hear the Word of God, guess what? It'll happen. And if you don't, guess what? It won't either. If you don't want to hear it, you don't want to grow, you don't want to know it, then guess what? You'll leave here the same way you came in. Totally unmoved, totally unchanged. But if you want to receive the Word of God, you want to receive Christ, that will happen today. And, and Jesus uh, made this statement about this same type of scenario that in, in Matthew's Gospel, in, in chapter 11, verses 25 to 26, says, it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. And so Jesus is not taken off guard by this. You know, it's it basically... If you want to know the Word of God, if you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll have it. He wants that for you. But if not, then He will not force Himself on anyone. All right, that, 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 He gives us this choice. So with all that being said, I would just ask you this morning, what is your attitude towards God and His Word? Right? This morning, right now, right now, at what time is it? 11.30 a.m. on uh, February 18, 2008. What is your attitude towards God and His Word this morning? Or are you here this morning because you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Right? Is, that, is that what you're here for? See, if you are here for those reasons, then you should expect for God to open the truth of His Word to you this morning. You see, if you came here this morning and you were empty and you're unconcerned about the things of God, it's very likely that you will leave here the very same way that you came in, as I've already said. It's like, what are your intentions here this morning. What is your attitude towards God? Do you have ears to hear and eyes to see? You see, if you do this morning, this short parable will, will reveal three truths to us. The same three truths about the kingdom of God that it did to those original disciples. And the first truth that we see in our passage is the beginning of the kingdom. The beginning of the kingdom of God. Verse 31 says this, it is like a mustard seed which in when it, is, when it is sown on the ground, it's smaller than all the seeds on earth. And so Jesus was not giving a botany lesson here. That's not what he was about. That's not what he's talking about, uh, that the mustard seed was tiny, right? It, it, it's incredibly small, uh, but there are smaller seeds in the world. This is the, the smallest one on the planet, per se. But what he's doing here is like he always teaches in ways that they would understand, that the, the mustard uh, plants, the mustard bushes, were common there in that area, and they would know exactly what uh, he's talking about here. So that's why he chose to use this as an example. That it, 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 it's a, a great example of how the kingdom of God would begin, that the seeds of the gospel were being sown everywhere that Jesus went, that he was steadily speaking the truth of God's word and inviting people to re repent, turn from their sins. But at, at this point, it seemed like very little was happening, right? As they, as they were going about, and, and mostly uh, people were coming to Jesus but they weren't coming to repent and believe. That weren't, that's weren't why they were coming. They were coming to him because of the miracles, right? They were coming to him to be healed. They were coming to be, uh, if they were lame, whatever their, their sickness or disease, or, or somebody had a loved one that was demon-possessed, right? That they, they would come to Jesus because they, because they heard that's what he was doing. He was uh, making people well in this sense. But they very few were coming to him to uh, be saved and uh, born again. That the crowds were massive but the converts were few. And so the disciples were picking up on this. They were seeing this, and they were probably uh, beginning to grow discouraged because they were seeing so few people actually uh, turning to Christ as Lord and Savior. And even though they were with Jesus around the clock, day to day, they would see Him, and they, and they had seen the miracles, and they had heard 
uh, how he taught with authority, still that nothing was happening. And so uh, uh, what Jesus is kind of doing here is, is preparing their hearts and encouraging them because he knew that they would hear the criticisms. Right? You know how it is that if somebody that you care for and, and they're having a bad time and, and they begin to, you want to support them, but everybody seems to be going against them, how hard it is on you to not get sucked into that type of situation. And so the very same thing is happening here. They would, they would hear all the, the reasons why uh, Jesus w- couldn't possibly be the Messiah. And, and, and you know, it, it just, they would hear that y'all were just a bunch of fools. Right? If y'all believe that this guy is the Messiah, you were a bunch of fools and you're wasting your life. And so what Jesus was doing is trying to prepare them and trying to help them see things a little more clearly that, that they're not following Jesus. It's not a mistake to do that. But I mean, think about it. The, the proof is, is pretty overwhelming. You could understand how they might begin to believe this for themselves. I mean, but after all, you know where Jesus was born, right? Bethlehem. Right? He was born in Bethlehem and in abject poverty. He was just the son of a, a carpenter. That's all he was. He was raised in Nazareth. You know where Nazareth is? Nobody knows where Nazareth is. It's just a little, a little hole in the wall, nowhere town. Nothing ever good comes from Nazareth. That he had no support from his own family. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. Only Mary, Mary his mother, she's the only one uh, that believed in him and understood. Uh, he had no money. Uh, he had no home. Uh, He was completely rejected by the religious leaders of his day. You see, if you think about Jesus just uh, looking at him from the outside, just looking at him at face value, uh, Jesus was just a nobody from nowhere. And you're following this guy. And they hear all these things. If y'all really believe that this is the Messiah, how could this be? And seeing, of course, to top it all off, the only ones that were following him was just a bunch of nobodies too. Right? If you look at it, who, who were the ones, who were the disciples? Just a bunch of common fishermen. Then you throw in a tax collector. Then you have a religious zealot. That's the ones that made up this group that were following Jesus. They were just 12 ordinary men. But maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the whole point. That's the point that, uh, that Jesus was making. You see, it was never about the messengers. It was always about the seed. It was always to be about the gospel that the power was in the, 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 the seed, the power was in the gospel itself, that the Apostle Paul would later write this to the Christians in Rome, right? And Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. You see those tiny seeds of the gospel that were being sown all over Galilee and all over Capernaum and all over Jerusalem. They, 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 were, they were falling everywhere. And as he shared in the parable, they were falling on hard ground and stony ground and thorny ground. But there were some that were falling on good ground. And he was saying to them, be encouraged. that The kingdom is growing. The kingdom of God is coming. Just, just, just wait and see. You'll see what's happening. But he would eventually, the, 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 this gospel would, 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 would go forth. This, this message of forgiveness and reconciliation uh, it, it, it came first to the Jews. That's the way the, the, the scriptures had, had, had uh, planned it or, or was prophesied to come that way to the, the people of God first. But eventually, it would spread to all people, to the ends of the world. That's what Paul meant there when he says to the Greeks. The, the Greeks is just a common phrase for non-Jews. That, that we, we would be Greeks or we would be Gentiles. Anyone who is a non-Jew is what Paul was speaking of there. That the seeds of the kingdom were being sown into the hearts of and people everywhere that Jesus and his disciples went. And like that tiny mustard seed, the kingdom of God started off seemingly small and insignificant. Seemingly small and insignificant. Not much going on, but see, the kingdom of God may have began with just 12 ordinary men, but it would grow exponentially. It would grow exponentially after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, which takes us to the second truth we see in our passage this morning, the building of the kingdom of God, the building of the kingdom of God. And in 32a, the first part of 32, it says, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs. So just to help you understand how small the mustard seed is, I did a little research this, this week and, and, and I, I wanted to be able to get my mind around it. And it's even smaller than I even thought it was. I, I found some information and I'm just basing off my research. I can't, I can't vouch for this 100%, but this is what I found. I, I saw that if you, ta- it, if you take 750 mustard seeds, uh, they will only weigh one gram. 
One gram. One gram. You know, and it takes 28 grams to make up one ounce. And if, if that's not clear enough for you, it takes 16 ounces to make one pound. Right? So it takes it. They're tiny. They're, they're, they're just almost minuscule. I don't even know how you would count something that small without a microscope. It says that a single seed weighs point zero 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 four four ounces. Pounds. Pounds, not ounces. That's tiny, right? Tiny. Tiny, tiny. But you see a full-grown bush can be as tall as 10 to 15 feet. More like a tree, right? When I, I would say something like that. I, these, these bushes would grow incredibly large. That as Jesus says, the, the, the master teacher that he is, that he picked this perfect example to, re to represent the, the growth of the kingdom. You know, as we look ahead in our Bibles, as we, as we, if you're familiar with your Bibles, uh, we can see that God is building his kingdom, right? He, he talks about this, especially in the book of Acts. We see it uh, probably the, the most prevalent or the, the explosion of the kingdom. The church is growing. At the day of Pentecost, we read, that, and basically the church started at that time with roughly 120 people. That, that's the beginning. That's how that happened. Then the day of Pentecost, the, the, uh, Peter got up and preached, and the Bible tells us that 3,000 people were saved. 3,000 were added on, on the day of Pentecost, and a short while later we have 5,000 more were added. And at one point, some estimations believe that the, the church had grown to upwards of 50,000 in Jerusalem alone in, in just a very, very short period of time. So you have Acts 1, 120, Acts 2, 3,000, Acts 4, 5,000, right? You see this, this exponential growth that this seed is blossoming. And as the, the per persecution of the church began uh, by the Jews and the Romans, as it began to crank up and intensify, uh, and, and Christianity was, was pushed out of Jerusalem, it began to spread all over the known world. Right? I always equate it kind of like to a grease fire. I've shared with the men before, they thought they was going to throw water on the fire of the gospel and, and snuff it out, but actually all it did is make things worse. It made a bunch of little fires and it spread everywhere. Everywhere the church was persecuted and and pressed out to, they took the gospel along with them. That, the, that, the, the, that Acts 1-8 was actually beginning to happen, that the gospel was going forth to every tribe, nation, and tongue. That those early believers, they were faithful to the mission of the gospel. They were faithful to that. They were faithful to the Great Commission. They took loving God and loving people and making disciples seriously, and God blessed their faithfulness. They sowed the seeds, and God made his kingdom grow. That's what we see happening here. That Luke tells us in Acts 2.47b uh, uh, that God was adding to his kingdom daily. And it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Daily. Can you imagine? Daily people being saved. But listen, the key is this. We must do our part. Why we must all do our part, we must sow the seeds of the gospel. That the more seeds that we sow, the more we tell people about Jesus, the greater potential for God to save. Right? It's, it's really that simple. The, the more we water that seed, the more we pray, and the more we live out the gospel for the lost, the greater the potential for God to save. That, that Paul would describe this partnership in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 5-7. to He says, when, Who then is Paul and, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one? He says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. God who gives the increase. You see that there? Who gives the increase? Who makes the kingdom grow? Who makes the kingdom come? It's God. He is the one building his kingdom. That, that God is the one. That he has chosen you and me to play a vital part in the process. So that's what we see in the scriptures. That even in the darkest of days that have occurred since Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father in heaven, the gospel has kept going forth. It has never stopped. It has never stopped moving. And you know why I know or how I can see that? We're here. Look around the room. You know where we're at? We're in Pitkin, Louisiana. This isn't Jerusalem. We're on the other side of the world. How did the gospel get here? How did this church get planted here? How did people get saved here? Because the gospel went forth. The kingdom of God is still growing. It's still coming. More and more people are being added. And faithful believers keep on telling people the good news that Jesus saves sinners. He keeps telling them, the, 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 they keep telling the gospel that God still will, will still be saving lost people even after the, 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 the tribulation period time. The Bible we looked about this a couple weeks ago that, that God 
uh, gave John a vision of those that were saved during the, that time that they were, uh, and they could not be numbered, right? And that's what we see in Revelation 7, 9 to 10. This is uh, after the tribulation period. It says, after these things I looked, this is John's vision, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, we sow, we water, and God builds His kingdom. Amen? That, that's how this works. And the third and final truth that we see in our passage is the blessings of the kingdom of God. 32b, that last part there. It says, and shoots uh, the, the bush, uh, the, and shoots out large branches so the, that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. All right, so this, this last part of the parable also is speaking to the size of the kingdom. That's what this, this bush is, the re- reference is. You see, only large bushes could have large branches. And so that's what Jesus is trying to get their minds around, the, the, the size of the kingdom. That those large branches would, would provide uh, places for nesting and protection from the harsh rays and that Palestinian sun. That's, they would understand that. They understand the, and appreciate the value of, of, of those large uh, bushes or trees, the, the, the shelter that they provided, uh, such a blessing there in that, that harsh climate. But you see, Jesus wasn't just uh, reminding the disciples of the benefits of mustard bushes to birds. That's not what he's doing here. That, that Jesus was reminding the disciples of the benefits of his kingdom. You see that this type of language, this type of uh, illustrations, this type of uh, imagery was often used in the Old Testament uh, uh, to, to represent kingdoms that, that brought strength and stability and blessings to the nations around them. Uh, and, and in fact, in, in Daniel 4 we see this. This is a, uh, the, the King Nebuchadnezzar was, was giving this this dream he'd been having for Daniel to interpret. We see the same type of analogy uh, here, the same imagery. It says, in beginning in verse 10 there of Daniel 4, uh, these were the visions of, of my head while on my bed. It says, I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and it, its height was great, and the tree grew and became strong, and its, its uh, height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of, uh, of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely. It's fruit abundant, and, and it was food for all. The, the beast of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. You see, the disciples would have been familiar with this, 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 this text and, and this symbolism, or at least they should have been anyway. The, the, the point that Jesus was making was that the gospel and the kingdom of God would, would bless the world like nothing had ever blessed before. All right, that's what he's saying here, that, that, that for both now and eternity, that, that this security and blessings would come. You see, when the, the church acts like the church, guess what? The, the, the communities around the church are blessed. Right? The people around the church is, is blessed. That, the, that, that when the people of God act like the people of God, when we're the salt and the light that we're created to be, the community is impacted spiritually and economically and culturally and, and morally. Right? We make a difference. That's what he's saying here, that we bring the light of the gospel to an other, otherwise uh, a dark world that, that's, that's in bondage to sin. That's what the church does, that we bring a message of hope to people that have grown hopeless. When natural disasters hit, guess what? The church is there. When times of sickness and death come, guess what? The church is there. When an unexpected financial crisis arises, guess what? The church is there. That's what he's talking about. The kingdom of God is here. That, that, that many people seem to, to, th- to think that Christianity, it, uh, it, it serves no purpose, that, 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 that the church serves no purpose. They see us as a nuisance instead of a blessing, right? You, you understand that. You see that all around us. We serve no purpose. And for some churches, you know what? Sadly, that might be true. That may be absolutely true. Just a religious social club. It makes no impact on the community whatsoever. But you see, when, when God will remove the church from the planet before the tribulation period, the whole world will realize just what a blessing the church was. When the church isn't in a community anymore, it makes a difference, or it should. When the church is removed at the end of times, the world will take notice. The light will be removed. The world will be turned to complete and utter darkness. They will know. They will know. And if people think things are bad now, just wait till the blessings of God's kingdom are removed. But you see, unquestionably, the greatest blessing of the church is the spiritual blessing. 
It's the spiritual blessings, the, the, the offer of the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God to be set free from the power and the penalty of sin. That the gospel itself is the greatest blessing the church has to offer the world. Right? That's the greatest blessing. The best thing we can do for this community is share the gospel. The best thing you can do for your children is share the gospel. The best thing you do for your coworkers is share the gospel. Right? That's what we're about. We're a gospel-sharing people. That the gospel itself is the greatest blessing that we have to offer. That nothing is greater than having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Those of you in here can say amen heartily. That nothing is better than that. And here is the gospel. John 3, 16 and 17. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That the kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. That's the emphasis here. That An everlasting kingdom. And the members of the kingdom have everlasting life. See, that's the connection here. If you, if you believe the gospel, you will experience the blessings of the kingdom both now and throughout all of eternity. Right? That's what the Bible teaches us. You see, there's, there's one final thought, and then I'll, I'll close. Right? You know, we talk about how great America is. You know what makes America great? You want me to tell you? It's not Donald Trump. It's not Donald Trump, no matter what the hats say. It's not our grit and our determination. And it's not our precious freedoms that we love so much. America is great because of the blessings of the gospel. That's why. That's why America is great. America owes its very existence and blessings to the spread of the gospel. That we were founded on the principles of the gospel and the Christian faith. And even those who reject the gospel and reject God in America, today they still reap the benefits of the nation that has been founded by God and for God. Amen? That's the absolute truth. So this morning as we close out our time here together, let me just ask you this. Brothers and sisters, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a member of this church, if you're, whether you're not, if you're following Christ, let me ask you this. Are you doing your part to ensure that the kingdom of God continues to grow? Are you doing your part? Are, are you sowing seeds? You see, let me, let me share some math with you that I found this week. It was very, just kind of blew my mind the, 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 the way this could possibly work, the, the, the potential for the kingdom to grow if, if every one of us would, would, would you know, share the gospel with somebody. You know, if a church with just 20 members, if 20 people, we'll start there as a, as a good round number to start with. If, if, if you had 20 believers and each one of those 20 believers were, were committed to share the gospel with just one person in a year, and God would bless, and he would save all 20 of those people. You know what you have the next year? 40, right? It's simple math, right? It says 20 times 2 is 40. And, it, and, it, and that continued on, right? If, if, if every person that got saved continued to share the gospel with just one person, right? And God were to, to, to save everyone that the gospel was shared with. You know what you'd have at the end of, of 20 years? Listen to this, this number. At the end of 20 years, you would have the number of believers would total uh, 20,971,520. If just one, if, if each one of us would share the gospel one, with one person and, he, and God would bless us and they would all come to faith. From 20 to nearly 21 million in 20 years. That's a lot of seed that's being sowed. See, my, my point is, we, we know that God doesn't save everyone that we share the gospel with, but I'm talking about the potential. Right? What if? You know, we've talked about it. If we don't share the gospel, then nobody will be saved. We know that, right? So we share the seeds and we, and we wait and we wait for God to, to build his kingdom. You see, that's what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed. You see, in the beginning, it was just Jesus and the tw these 12 nobodies, but they proved themselves to be faithful nobodies. And, and, and according to Pew Research Center, uh, as of 2010, Christianity is the largest religion in the world with 2.2 billion believers worldwide. Can you believe that? I know, I know the world don't look like it. You'd think if, if we're the largest religion worldwide that the world would look differently, but that's the numbers. That's the research that 2.2 billion believers, from 12 to 2.2 billion reported. And that's just the ones that were in places where they could have these surveys and people could actually you know, collect these numbers. 
right? In the kingdom of God, it's already massive, but you know what? It continues to grow with every second of every day that passes. It is still growing, that God is building his kingdom. Don't ever underestimate the power of the gospel. Don't ever underestimate the power of the gospel. Sow those tiny seeds and then watch God produce a tree. Amen? Sow those seeds and watch God go to work. So my question for each one of you this morning is this. Right? We've talked about the kingdom of God and the benefits of the kingdom of God and all these things. But I just want to ask you this morning, are you certain that you're a member of the kingdom of God? <coughs> Notice I didn't say are you a member of this church. Right? They, they should be the same, but that's not always the case. I ask you, are you a member of the kingdom of God? Are you certain that you're a member of the kingdom of God? You say, well, how will I know, Brother Mike, is there fruit? Is there fruit? As we talked about Sunday school this morning, is there works of repentance? Is there evidence there? Has your life changed in radical ways? Do you hate what God hates and love what God loves? You see, this morning you say, well, I'm not sure if I am. I'm not sure if I am or not, Brother Mike. Well, I would tell you this. Ask God to make it clear to you this morning. Ask God to make it clear to you to to give you an overwhelming sense of peace or give you an overwhelming sense of conviction. Let let Him trouble your heart this morning. that, That you leave this place knowing for sure that you're a member of the kingdom of God or you're not a member. And you see, if you're not a member this morning and you know you're not, guess what? You can be before you leave this place today. You can before you leave this place today. And, and here's how it happens. The Bible tells us that we must repent of our sin, right? Or to turn from our sin. Not just to be sorry for it or feel bad about it, but to turn away from it. To, to see it as God sees it and to walk away from it. Acts 3.19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And then also, to be saved, to become a member of the kingdom of God, uh, we must profess our faith in Jesus. Right? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth of confession is made unto salvation. And then once you do that, you get baptized and you join a Bible pre- uh, preaching, Bible teaching, and Bible believing church. And I think I know one. If you're looking for one, I think I know one. I, I think I know a pretty good one that you'd, you'd be welcomed at. And they would be sure to disciple you and raise you up and help you to grow in your faith. Right? And get discipled in the ways of Jesus. Learn the Bible. Uh, live the Bible. And then get busy sowing your own mustard seed. Right? That's, what, that's how it works. That's the process. That's how the kingdom grows. And I would invite you then to get busy doing your own part, growing the kingdom of God. So I'm not sure this morning how this has spoken to you. And, and, and maybe you got more information. Maybe you understand the kingdom better. Uh, or maybe today that, 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 that God is inviting you, that your heart has been pricked by the word and the spirit of God has been working on your heart this whole time I've been talking. That, that he's doing a work and today is a day of salvation. Today is a day you become a member of his kingdom. Right? Or maybe you just need prayer. Or, or maybe you've been a believer for a long time. You've never been baptized. Or maybe, I'm not sure what God is telling you to do. But all, all I would do is invite you to do whatever God is leading you to do before you leave this place today. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have a time to do just that. A time to respond. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the, the, the truthfulness of your word. We thank you for the, 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 the power in your word, God. We thank you for the clarity uh, of your word today. Lord, let us be encouraged as, as we see the, the, the truth of your word today, as we look at the parable of this mustard seed, something that is so, so tiny, even microscopic, if you would say, that, that it would start out so small and to, and to grow to be such a large, large plant. What a great illustration of what the kingdom of God is. To start so small when it would just a a small group of men, some, some un, uh, unpopular, uh, just common nobodies, and, and you would use those men to grow your kingdom to what it is today, and it will continue to grow if your church is faithful. So God, help us to be faithful. Uh, Father, I pray for those that are here this morning that, that perhaps have not uh, ever placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God, that today would be that day, that today they would uh, have the courage to to step out and say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. I understand that I have, 
I have grieved God's heart, and, and, and I'm, I'm, because of my sin, I'm under the wrath of God, and I want to be free from that. I want to be free from the, the penalty. I want to be free from the, the bondage of sin, and I, and I want to, 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 to be Jesus to be my <coughs> Lord and Savior today. God, I also pray for those here this morning that are just, just troubled, just, just grieved for, or for any number of reasons, that there's, a, that there's a, a, just a, a, a hearts that are broken in this place for various reasons, people that need discernment. God, I pray for them that you would bless them in their need. God, help us to respond to you the way you want us to respond before we leave this place. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.